While coming up with the Dirac equation, Paul Dirac noticed that some coefficients in his equation have to be matrices for the whole thing to work. But not any matrices. Those matrices used in the Dirac equation have to fulfill certain rules which are collected in the so-called Clifford algebra anti-commutation rules. An anti-commutator between A and B, denoted with curly brackets, is a shorthand notation for AB plus BA. So the anti-commutator between two of the Dirac's matrices has to be equal to something. There are four gamma matrices, gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2 and gamma 3, which can be summarized into gamma mu. This looks like a 4 vector. However, remember that when we choose, say, mu equals to 2, then the resulting element is a matrix, not a scalar number. In fact, they are 4 by 4 matrices. To be more general, for d spacetime dimensions, they are 2 to the power of floor d over 2 by 2 to the power of floor d over 2 matrices, where the part in red is the floor function. So for our 3 spatial and 1 temporal dimensions, d equals 4 and 2 to the power of 4 over 2 is equal to 4. But if we consider only one space dimension and one time dimension, which is usually the case for the strings in string theory, the gamma matrices are 2 by 2 matrices. So inside our anti-commutator we put the gamma matrices. Since we don't want to write many different relations, for instance gamma 1 with gamma 2, gamma 3 with gamma 0 and so on, we choose a placeholder for both. So we write gamma mu and gamma nu. And what's on the right hand side? In order for his equations to work, Paul Dirac saw that on the right hand side there has to be 2 times the Minkowski metric times the unit matrix. Since the metric looks like this, the anti-commutator is very often 0, in particular exactly when mu and nu are different. So gamma 0 with gamma 3, 0. Gamma 2 with gamma 1, 0. And gamma 3 with gamma 3, this is 2 times minus 1 times the identity matrix. So minus 2 times the identity matrix. The useful properties are the following. First, if you take two different gamma matrices and switch their place, you pick up a minus sign. This follows from the anti-commutators like this one here. Second, if you square a gamma matrix, depending on if it's the zero one or another, you get plus or minus the identity matrix. This follows from the anti-commutators here. There we have it. Using this anti-commutation relation, you will be able to solve most of the problems you encounter. Actually, there is one more gamma matrix called gamma 5. You can calculate it either as a product of all other gamma matrices or via the Levi Civita epsilon symbol. The interesting thing about this matrix is that its anti-commutators with all other gamma matrices are zero. And did you know this? We did not say anything about how the matrices really look like. We only know that they are 4 by 4 matrices, but apart from that, we know nothing. This is the beauty and the curse of representations. But that's enough stuff for a different video. So that's pretty much it for this time. Thanks for watching.